A woman who survived the horrors of Nazi concentration camps knew that the greatness of God in the darkest of days. Corey Ten Boom said, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. And the greatest evidence of the depth of God's love is that his son came to earth to be one of us, died on a cross to conquer the grave for us, and on the third day rose from the dead. And we're going to take just a few minutes here this morning. I know you've got kids with you. But we're going to look at what happened on that first Easter. And uh, this is a review, if you were here last year. But I know this is, was a big paradigm shift for a lot of us, to, to think through this lens of what actually happened. This re the review this week helped me. So first, let's look at what Jesus told his disciples at the Last Supper, just hours before his arrest. John 14, 1, he said, all right, guys, don't let your hearts get troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. I'm telling you, I, there, there, there's a place for you there. I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's saying you can't live with the Father right now. In fact, you can't even have a relationship with him yet. But I'm about to change that. I'm about to fix this situation forever. But I got to go away to do it. But I'll be right back. I promise. I'm going to be right back. And he makes that statement several times in his discourse with him. And in verse 25, he says, these things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. And it's beyond anything you can get through transcendental meditation or anything else. This is supernatural peace. So he's telling them they're about to get two gifts. And these are huge. You're going to get the Holy Spirit, and you'll get my supernatural peace. And the reason we have that in your notes there, uh, for you to just fill that in, is because I want you to remember those two things. We're going to come back to those, all right? Verse 29, I've told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I'm not going to talk with you much from here on out. For the ruler of the world is coming, the ruler of this world is coming, but, and he has nothing in me. He said, I have to go to the Father, but I'll be back, right back. You'll see me again. I'm telling you this before it happens, so you won't chuck your faith, so you won't panic, so you won't go, oh, you know, the world is ending. You'll still believe. That's what Jesus says about the first Easter on Thursday night. Now, now think of the timeline. Thursday evening, he says this. On Friday, he goes to the cross. And, of course, we remembered that on Good Friday here. He dies. The next event takes place on Friday night or sometime on Saturday. If Ephesians 4 tells us Jesus went down into the lower parts of the earth. In verse 8, the apostle Paul quotes uh, the Old Testament passage in Psalm 68, 18, saying, when he ascended on high, get this, this is so awesome. He led captivity captive. Now, this he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And to get clarity on what happened down there, Jesus actually gives us the insight himself in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 1.18, he said, I am he who lives, was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And look at this. I, and I have, ooh, I love this, the keys of Hades and death. Now, Hades is the Greek word that means the boat of the dead. Every person that had died before Christ went to a waiting place, someplace uh, sometimes called the bosom of Abraham in, in Scripture. Well, right after Jesus dies on the cross, he walks into this place. Only he doesn't just passively sit around with the rest of the Old Testament saints. He looks at Satan and says, I'm here for the keys. Give them to me. Amen. Now, this came, you know, suddenly they realize, uh-oh, uh-oh, death's not going to hold him. Death's not going to keep this man. I mean, he's a man, and he died. But he died as an innocent man, 
for our sins. Death's not going to work on this guy. And not only that, but he now has power to empty the place. And we know that. We know it was a shock to the devil. We know that he's blown away by this because Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. He says, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God. His plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it to our... Uh, for our ultimate glory before the world began. But the rulers of this world, and he's not just talking about earthly rulers, he's talking about spiritual rulers, demonic hierarchies that, that still try to hold sway. But the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, get this, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. Satan had no idea what was happening on that cross. He can't understand love. It was inconceivable to him that God would love us this much, that he would send his only son to live an innocent life as a human being so that he could die in our place. He had no concept that he was nailing our sins to Jesus' cross until he got to Hades (laughs) and said, I want the keys. Death couldn't hold him. He came forth. Now, that's, that, that means there's, we, ha, we no longer have to fear death, physical or spiritual. He overcame them both. There's no fear of death for a believer, period. It's the number one fear of all humans. Every fear is directly tied to that. People say, you know, I'm a sna- afraid of snakes. We had a snake yesterday in my basement right beside my study. Oh, and I don't like snakes. But you know, I'll say I'm afraid of snakes. Really, I'm afraid of being bitten by a snake and dying. That's really what I'm afraid of. Or I'm afraid of heights. No, you're afraid of falling and dying. I'm afraid of germs. No, you're afraid of getting sick and dying. I mean, we're really afraid not of the things. We're afraid of what they, you know, of dying from those things. And Jesus overcame the fear of death by overcoming death itself. He literally got the keys of Hades place of the dead, not to lock people in. We were already locked in. That's where we were all headed. It was our eternal destination. Jesus got the keys to let us out. So he takes the keys of hell and death from the devil, and get this, he unlocks Hades for all the Old Testament saints who had been waiting for him to come, and he takes them to heaven. David talks about this in Psalm 16, 10, when he said, For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. He was looking forward to this event. He saw it. Now, Jesus didn't open the gates for the wicked yet. That's still to happen in the not-too-distant future. The Bible says they'll all stand before the Father's great white throne and be judged. So Jesus frees the saints. Stay with me on this. He frees the saints, and he heads toward heaven. But first he says, we got we to make a stop by earth because i got to tell Mary to have the disciples to meet me. And I told them, but they're so upset, I'm not banking on them remembering and that. And if you want something done right, give it to a woman. <laughs> Heard a lot of women say amen on that one. Well, that brings us to Sunday morning, all right? So Sunday morning now. This, is, this has happened. The first, the first Easter, John 20, verse 1 says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So Mary runs back to tell the disciples. Peter and John run back to the tomb with her, look in, see it's empty, take off home, I guess, to tell the rest of the guys. And Mary's there weeping alone. But when she looks in the tomb, verse 12 says, she saw two angels in white where the body of Jesus had lain. Now, contrary to popular opinion, these two didn't show up to move the stone so Jesus could get out. They moved the stone so we could get in. It was for us to see that he wasn't there. Jesus didn't need help. He wasn't in the tomb yelling, hey, any angels out there? You know, just defeated Death, hell, and the grave, but I can't seem to get this stone out of the way. <laughs> no, the angels moved the stone for us. If death couldn't stop him, no piece of real estate could stop him. And we know that because later in the story, when all his followers are huddled together behind locked doors that have been bolted shut, Jesus shows up and doesn't even knock. He just walks right through the door. You know what that means? There's no closed door he can't open. 
There is, I'm sure every one of us can think of some circumstance in our life or somebody we know, some situation where we go, man, that, that door's bolted shut. I mean, there's no, that's never going to happen. He is so hard-headed and hard-hearted, and she is so closed-minded, and her head, her mind's just sealed shut. There, nobody can get through. If the risen Christ can walk through walls, I got news for you. There is no situation he can't walk into, no person he can't get through to, no, no situation, circumstance he can't change. You know, it it's, it's comes down to what Jesus told us. He said, ask and keep on asking. Knock and keep on knocking. I love that video that they prayed for their family in the Philippines and how God gave them assurance and, and everybody was all right. 90% of the homes knocked out and their families were fine. I mean, come on. Jesus rose from the dead. He can, nothing, he said, is impossible if we'll believe. Well, back at the tomb, the angel says, woman, why are you weeping? Mary said, because they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they laid him. Now, when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and for some reason didn't know it was Jesus. And he said, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, just tell me where you've laid him. I'll, I'll take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. <laughs> he opened her eyes. She could recognize him. She said, Rabboni. Which, you know, you, you get the picture. She's grabbing for him. And remember, this is uh, on Thursday. He told her, he told all the disciples, he said he'd be going to the Father. She said, no, 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 not, not yet. Don't touch me yet. I haven't ascended to the Father. Go to my brothers. Go to, go to my brethren. Say to them, what, this is it. It's happening. It's happening. Everything I told you, it's happening. It's right now. As we speak, I'm ascending to my Father. And look at this. And to your Father, to my God, and to your God. In other words, I'm about to fix this situation so you can have a relationship with the Father too. Mary starts to grab me and says, no, 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 not yet. Heaven ascended. We're not done. We're not done. But I'm going now. I'll be right back, just like I promised. Tell my brothers it's happening. Now, did I get that right? Isn't that what the story says? Isn't that exactly when it happened? All right, now remember, this is not the ascension. This is not 40 days. For 40 days, Jesus appears to his disciples, and then he ascends into heaven. That's not this. This is Easter. This is, this, this is the day. So all the Old Testament saints he released from Hades, they're still with him. They're still out there watching this whole thing go on. And we know that because Matthew 27, 52 says, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. A bunch of them got their resurrected bodies early. Here's what I think happened. When, when Jesus said, I got to stop by her, some of them said, do you mind if we walk around? We, we haven't seen a place in a long time, and I'd, I'd love to see what they've done with it, you know? So they're touring the city. I, I, that, I mean, that's what we just read. I picture Moses saying, hey, David, I, I played Little League right over there where that McDonald's is. You see that over there? <laughs> and Jesus leads them. So he takes, so we're done. He's done. He, he's done talking to Mary, having Mary get the boys. And he's headed for heaven now with the Old Testament saints. And another Old Testament passage gives us a picture of what I think happened that Sunday afternoon of the first Easter. They, they, they left earth and arrive at this huge gate to the heavenly city that uh, it doesn't look like the one we saw in the video. I mean, it's, it's made out of a single pearl, the Bible says. It's colossal. And David says, hey, guys, I think this is it. This is the fulfillment of that psalm the Lord gave me, Psalm 24. And together they yell out, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. And the angelic protectors throw back their challenge over the ramparts. Who is this king of glory? David says, let's tell them, guys. The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. And as those huge gates open up, Jesus leads this procession. He leads Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Ruth and Esther and Moses and all the Old Testament saints right into the heavenly city. Death 
lost its stinger that day. The grave is no longer the victor, the Bible says. I want to tell you, I've been at too many, too many bedsides where people who knew Jesus left. <laughs> this is a reality, folks. It's a big, there, there's a cataclysmic, I mean, a, 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 a chasm difference between a person who knows Jesus and a, a person who doesn't when they die. There's yet another Old Testament passage that tells us what happened next. Daniel 7 is the best known uh, prophecy about Jesus' second coming, but it also relates what happened on that first Easter. When it comes to Bible prophecy, it really is helpful to know that they're layered, and many times you'll see, you know, two or three fulfillments of that prophecy, like uh, we, we see uh, predictions about Jesus' first coming and second coming uh, uh, prophesied together, and that's one of these kind of things. Daniel 7 verse 9 says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. Now, that's the Father. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. It's got wheels. It's mobile. Ezekiel saw the same thing, wheels. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. I want to assure you of something you may have never heard before. Death, hell, and the grave have been totally conquered. And it happened right here. We're about to see it. Just the week before, on Palm Sunday, Jesus had told his disciples when he had, had gotten you know, away from the crowd and was alone with them, he said in John 12, 31, he says, now, guys, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world is cast out. This is the moment when it happened. This is how it went down. Satan is about to get his dominion taken away right here. The writer of Hebrews describes it. Jesus, as our high priest, steps forward and offers his blood on the altar of heaven as the full payment for all of our sins. Hebrews 10, 11 says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. That's us he's talking about. When Jesus offered his blood on the altar of heaven, Satan lost all power over us. His only ability to dominate us was sin. And Jesus' blood on that altar totally removes our sin. It washes us. This is why we have freedom to resist the devil. This is, next week we're going to talk about how that works. I hope you'll be back for that. We're free. Our chains are broken. Just like Jesus said, Satan can come at us. He's got nothing on us or in us. It's also why we don't have to offer animal sacrifices anymore. The Bible says the sacrifice of Jesus was once for all for all time. Then in Daniel's vision, he sees one like the Son of Man. That's very interesting because that's the name Jesus calls himself. Now, any Jew in that time knew about Daniel and knew Daniel's statement about the Son of Man coming. And Jesus assumes that name. He calls himself the Son of Man over and over. And everybody, you know, that was a Jew in that time knew, oh, you're calling yourself this guy, because look, look at it. He sees one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. So they knew he was calling himself the Messiah. The clouds of heaven, the Bible, the, uh, the Bible scholars say that's the Old Testament saints who are still with him. So he came to the Ancient of Days, and they, the clouds of heaven, the saints, brought him near before him. So I'm picturing him riding on their shoulders, you know, kind of like after a big Super Bowl win. You know, this is a big deal. It's a procession. And then to him, to Jesus, was given dominion. Let's read this together. Was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one that shall not be destroyed. 
on the afternoon of the first Easter, after Jesus had ascended to the Father, he took back rule of the earth. It happened right here. Adam lost it in the garden. He handed it over to Satan. And now it's returned to the man, Jesus Christ. Jesus will forever, get this, wrap your head around this one, will forever now be both God and man. I don't understand how that works, but it, he didn't drop his humanity when he went back to heaven, when he ascended. There is a man sitting on the throne in heaven. There is a Jewish man sitting at the right hand of God. And there is a Jewish man who is coming back to earth to reign on the earth from Jerusalem. Whoa. And Daniel continues in verse 21, I was watching and the Antichrist was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Jesus came into the courtroom of heaven, having paid for our sin. He offers his blood on the altar. The devil comes in. The Father looks at Jesus, looks at the devil, and he says, here's my verdict. Saints win, demons lose. There it is. That's the verdict. It's done. That happened 2,000 years ago on that first Easter. It's not going to happen. It happened. It's a done deal. And I can tell you as one who's been set free, I mean, you don't have to live in bondage to the fear of death. You don't have to live in bondage to alcohol or drugs or pornography or whatever because Jesus has all dominion. He broke the chains of sin to set you free, and he's here in the person of his spirit today to make that real. A few weeks later in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus still appearing to him. He's still here roaming around, you know, talking to the disciples. He said, he said to him one day, he said, I've given you authority. All, he said, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. In other words, Adam lost it. I got it back. And it all happened the first Easter. We have victory because of what happened on that first Easter. If you want victory in your life, all you have to do is quit trying to play God. Just surrender to Jesus. And you do that by just simply putting your faith in it. That's how you come under his rule. Otherwise, you're still living under the dominion of a defeated foe. Okay, the day's almost over. Let's, let, let's talk about Sunday night because this is the end, the evening of the first Easter. John 20, verse 19 says, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. <laughs> Peace be with you. <laughs> he liked to scare them, I think. Can you imagine? Boom, you know, <laughs> whoa, you know. It's a ghost. They saw him on the water one day, you know, walking out on the water. It's a ghost. No, it's me. It's me. Jesus is standing there among them. It doesn't, makes a whole lot of sense that his first words would be, peace, peace, shh, shh, shh. calm down. Don't die, you know. <laughs> peace be with you. He said, as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. That morning, remember what he told Mary? He said, don't touch me. I'm going to the Father. I'm on my way. What's he saying now? Touch me, touch me, feel. Come on, feel my hands, feel my hands. See, I'm here. This is really me. The sacrifice has been made. It's been done. I've been to the Father. It's, you know, I've already ascended. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. He could have said, I told you guys, I told you. And don't miss this. He says, again, he said, now this is important. This is what I want you to get. Again, he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Then he breathed on him and said, receive who? There we go. You remember two things he promised? Two things. He said, I'm going away, but I'm coming back with two things. My peace and the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you before it happens, so when it happens, you'll believe. This Easter, Jesus is alive. And more than anything, I mean, he is alive. He is real. And more than anything, he wants you to believe. He wants you to trust in the fact that he can set you free from sin and hell and death and all the fears that you have related to that stuff. His love is so deep. He wants you to experience his peace 
and receive the gift of his spirit. This is not a fairy tale. This is a fixed reality that God wants to make real to you. And I'd like to pray for you now. But that very miracle to happen on the inside of you today. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's just, Lord, before you right now, we stand. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for what you have done. You have done everything necessary to purchase our freedom. Help us to believe the truth. Help us to believe in what really happened on that first Easter, that you came back to life, that you came back from hell with all authority over sin and death, and that you went into the courtroom of heaven, and that you offered your blood once and for all to purchase our not guilty verdict. You came back to give us your peace and your Holy Spirit. God, make that real to every one of us here today so we can embrace it and receive it and experience it firsthand. Jesus, we thank you we thank you for your presence here. We pray all of that in your powerful name as you taught us to. And everybody said, amen. amen.